Why It Matters is back. For those of you who haven't seen these before, the Why It Matters videos are essentially my reaction to the, the canonical cornerstone pieces of content. So with those big pieces of content like the two Nietzsche videos, I try and keep myself out of it as much as possible and let the content speak for itself. Then I have the reason why the topic fascinates me in the first place and why I personally find it so important. And I don't really know what to do with that usually and that's where these Why It Matters videos came from. So in this video, I wanna tell you why I find Nietzsche's work so compelling and why I think you should too. Those of you who've been following the channel for a while will know that I'm quite fond of Nietzsche and that makes this a bit tougher than other videos because it's hard to articulate why I love him so much but that's where making the two videos about Nietzsche was actually a really good thing because it's made me a lot more conscious of the reasons he's captivated me for so many years. The thing is that Nietzsche is the bridge between so many of the topics that fascinate. Why I love the existentialism of Camus or the philosophy of the ancients whether that's Heraclitus or the Stoics or why I fell in love with Jung's work immediately and more recently why I've developed a fondness for postmodern thinking. All of these themes and concerns confluence in Nietzsche, because Nietzsche is the essence of living philosophy. I suppose the main reason I find Nietzsche so compelling is that he's still so relevant. He's the philosopher of the nihilistic age, and I think that there's something important in Nietzsche's experience that you see in Kierkegaard and Heidegger as well, and that's the fact that he straddled worlds. He grew up in the German heartlands. His father was a pastor who had tutored the princesses of the Duchy of Altenburg, contrast between this medieval sort of background give a visceral punch to Nietzsche's understanding of the death of God. It's a similar pattern to what you see in Kierkegaard and Heidegger. There's something about this experiential living through two worlds, growing up in a more medieval world and moving into the world of modernity, that makes the problem far more sharp for these thinkers. These existentialist philosophers struggle so deeply with a problem that those of us born deep into modernity take for granted. But taken for granted or not, nihilism is still a fundamental problem for us. Just because a frog is unaware of the increasingly hot water he finds himself in, doesn't mean that it won't ultimately kill him. And so, one reason why I find Nietzsche so important is that he feels this problem of our age so acutely and he wrestles with it so earnestly. His diagnosis of decadence, his questions about the value of truth, instinct, science and religion are as valuable today as they were when he wrote them over a century ago. But there's something else in Nietzsche that makes him specifically stand out to me, and that's the collective, almost religious element of his existentialism. I've been thinking a lot recently about the value of eudaimonia, of happiness and the good life. One of the bonus episodes on Patreon, I explored the idea that existentialism is a form of self-protection that comes in times of crisis. I've been thinking that the knee-jerk reaction in times of nihilism is to curl up in the philosophical fetal position of existentialism. Like Socrates and the Stoics or Kierkegaard and Camus, the initial reaction is the bluster of self-preservation. I'll probably go into this in more depth in a future video, but it just seems to me that the single-minded concern with our own flourishing, with finding meaning in our own lives and becoming who we are, is necessary, but it's not sufficient. To be good philosophers, we have to have these things integrated and digested, but we also have to have a lot more. The example that always comes to mind when I think about this is Cato the Younger who's idealised by everyone from Dante to George Washington. Cato was a conservative Roman senator, a diehard Stoic and a thorn in the side of Julius Caesar. In a time of hyper-complexity, Cato became a fundamentalist Stoic, sticking to the Stoic belief that virtue is the only thing that matters and the rest is indifferent. The Roman senator became a rigid moral ideal. As his biographers Goodman and Sony put it, Cato made a career out of purity, out of his refusal to give an inch in the face of pressure to compromise and deal. This strategy of all or nothing ended in crushing defeat. No one did more than Cato to rage against his republic's fall, yet few did more in the last accounting to bring that fall to pass. For this reason, Cato and the myopic goal of self actualization in general stands out to me as a warning rather than an ideal. Again, it's necessary, but it's not sufficient. Those who don't tend to their own inner work are like bulls in a china shop. Doing the inner work is not enough. You can't treat yourself like an individual wave. You need to relate to the ocean. Our responsibility goes deeper than a single wave. And that's why I love Nietzsche. He straddles these worlds amazingly. 
He deals so well with the individual element, but he also tends to the collective side of the equation so brilliantly as well. He sees himself as a doctor, not just the doctor of individuals, but of the culture as a whole. He speaks so much to personal psychology, but he speaks even more to interpersonal collective psychology. Ken Wilber's model of the four quadrants, which many of you will remember from our earlier episode, is again a great way of illustrating this. We have that concern with self-actualization in the upper left quadrant, but it's down here in the lower left quadrant of the collective internal that we find Nietzsche, the postmodernists, and the later Freud and Jung working. And that personally is where I feel a real pull towards. When Jung talks about Wotan awakening in the German psyche after the First World War, when Foucault talks about the imminent, intentional, non-subjective power, When Deleuze talks about assemblages and when Nietzsche talks about decadence and Dionysus, I can just feel there's so much important work to be done. This domain of what Wilbur calls the internal and collective is the realm of the gods. It's the realm of the forces that are driving culture at a collective level of the psyche. In many ways, it's harder to grasp than the external collective studies of systems thinking, chaos theory, Marxist economics, or utilitarian effective altruism, for the same reason that neuroscience makes us feel safe. When you get into the individual or cultural psyche, it's really hard to get a grasp of anything. It's really hard to quantify anything. We're moving through a labyrinth in thick fog. It's tough to make any headway, but it's incredibly important. Collective change requires an understanding of collective psychology. And these are the exact swamps that Nietzsche throws himself into. He has the audacity to make a diagnosis of our entire zeitgeist. He sees himself as the doctor and the culture as the patient, and he goes about diagnosing and prescribing. As a value worker, he does what science cannot. He probes the value of values. In the opening aphorism of Beyond Good and Evil, he asks why we should prefer truth to untruth when untruth has been just as important to human existence, to continuation of life, as truth ever was. Nietzsche is a pioneer into the instinctual realm of our collective value system, and that is why he matters. But that's not the only reason. You could say that Jung and Freud or Deleuze and Foucault transcend him, since they build on his work and take it further in a certain direction. But that's not entirely true. Because there's something wilder about Nietzsche than about any of these thinkers. There's something more unhinged in reading him. Reading Thus Spoke Zarathustra or Ecce Homo, there's an intoxication with Nietzsche. He's not studying the instinctual realm from a distance. He's chained himself to an anvil and jumped into the ocean. He doesn't keep himself grounded. He wants to see how far he can go. In another mini episode on Patreon, I talked about how the power of Nietzsche's style comes from his demolition of the wall between self and spirit. There's a type of psychological inflation in Nietzsche's work that makes reading him like consuming raw archetype. Reading Nietzsche is an almost religious experience. There's just a different energy in his writing to anybody else you'll read. I've never managed to make it through Thus Books Arthur because... I've I've started it and I get to a certain point where I can feel my soul filling with this energy, like an unhinged energy, and I can feel pulling me in a direction that just doesn't seem healthy. And yeah, I I think I can give it a go this year. I feel more grounded as I get a bit older and I think I can handle it without being carried off. But yeah, it was all scary to me how intoxicating it was. But if you read him, you get a perspective which is so different to any other thinker. He says things that any sane person never would. He's like the Charles Bukowski of philosophy. He says so many things that are so wrong and they're shocking. And if you want to know what I mean, just read anything he says about women after 1883. It's all part of the work that he's doing though. It's He's He's breaking the chains of the psyche. He's breaking free from the prisons in his mind so that he can go further. Every bit of philosophy that he does, and there's this one saying that he has that stuck at me, and he says that for the philosopher, nothing whatever is impersonal. And he's contrasting this to the scientist. So everything that he's doing in his work is personal. He's trying to work with his own psyche. He's trying to break free from his own condition and to to work like a doctor experimenting on himself with his own works. The great thing with Nietzsche is that you can be reading him, disagreeing with him, but still have the jolliest time of it. He's so provocative, and because his perspective is so different, the disagreements you end up having with him are so fertile. When I was younger, I was fascinated by Eastern philosophy and by the idea of enlightenment and mysticism. 
Nietzsche was the only voice I had speaking against this convincingly. And that's not because he's calling you to money or status or worldliness, which is the usual counter ideal. He's got a different spiritual path, the Dionysian path. There's a wildness in what he's saying that's so compelling and inject so much cognitive dissonance into my mind. And while it wasn't enough to kill the exotic allure of enlightenment immediately, it did crack the foundations so that it would crumble far easier when the time came. And so these are the reasons why Nietzsche matters. The two videos I focus on the more psychoanalytical Nietzsche, because I think that this is the most neglected legacy of him. But he's equally the father of existentialism, and after the collapse of structuralism and the Marxist strain in French philosophy, it was Nietzsche who became the foundation of a new era of philosophy, the postmodern, post-structuralist philosophy. Through Nietzsche, these three great traditions, existentialism, postmodernism, and psychoanalysis, converge and join with the great conversation that is philosophy. He is without a doubt one of the greatest and most important philosophers in history, which makes it very simple and very difficult to answer the question of why Nietzsche matters. That's everything for this Why It Matters episode of The Living Philosophy. I hope you've enjoyed it. I want to thank Shane, Croissant Eater, Abyssal Fayissa, David Pilibosian, and all the other patrons for their support of the channel. If you'd like to get access to weekly bonus episodes, monthly Q&As, and get your name in the credits like these wonderful people, then you can head over to Patreon. As ever, if you have any thoughts, insights, or feedback, I'd love to hear from you down in the comments. Otherwise, I shall see you next time. Thank you for watching.